Nicht so einfach. Er kommt nämlich nicht nur von der FU Berlin, sondern er kommt eigentlich aus Kanada, ist sozusagen ein Native English Speaker, was ihr bei der Präsentation gleich äh, mitkriegen könnt. Deutsch hat er übrigens bei seinen Schwiegereltern beim Skat gelernt. Eine Methode, die er sich vielleicht patentieren lassen sollte. Ähm, sein Ziel ist es, erster Professor in Light at Night Studies zu werden. Äh, ambitioniert. Um Licht in der Nacht dreht es sich auch in seinem Vortrag. Applaus für Christopher Keimer! Ich hoffe, ich greife dich vor. Lässt du das Licht an, wenn du nachts ins Bett gehst? Nein. <lacht> auch nicht als Leid in meinem Professor. Viel Spaß mit Christopher Keimer! So, herzlichen Dank. So, ich rede heute über Lichtverschmutzung. Das ist Light Pollution auf Englisch. Und ich mag die Vorträge auf Englisch gegen die Zeit. Wenn Sie Fragen haben, bitte kommen in die Pause und ich könnte ein bisschen, oh, ein bisschen Deutsch reden. So, what's light pollution and why do we worry about it? It's the classic sense is sky glow, where you can't see the stars when you're inside of a city. But why should we care about that? Well, there's one very good reason. Light pollution can kill you. Look at the star. If you're a hamster. <laughs> we'll come back to the hamsters in a little bit. But first, let's talk about uh, what the Earth was like at night. So here's a satellite photograph of the Earth a billion years ago at nighttime. And the Earth was really, really boring back then because there was no beer at all. On the plus side, there were no dinosaurs to eat you. On the downside, sex hadn't even been invented yet. And so, of course, in terms of Nachhaltigkeit, I don't think that we really want to keep the world like that. So we come about halfway to here, the satellite picture still shows nothing. And, uh, but the world has changed now because now sex was invented. But it's some kind of ancient insect sex. I'm not sure how interesting that really is. So let's go forward again. And now at least we have sort of large animals. So it's kind of looking a little bit more like the Earth. They're not dinosaurs yet, but that happens now. And now you're really glad that the Earth is black at night because then you can't see it as the Tyrannosaurus Rex comes to eat you. So of course an asteroid smashed into the Earth, killed all the dinosaurs, and that was great for us because it meant that all of the little mammals that were excellent at sex could make all kinds of different kinds of mammals. And about five million years ago, we split off from the other primates and went our own way. And so that brings us to 3,000 years, uh, 5,000 years ago, when civilization started because beer was invented. <laughs> But of course, with beer, there's the downside that you end up with a bill, and so that's an ancient Sumerian beer bill. And now we come to uh, 600 years ago when the satellites still showed almost nothing, but you would start to see something because that was when we started to have artificial light at night with, uh, with gas lanterns. And so, I'll confess, these aren't really satellite pictures. Um, if they were, you would probably be able to see one or two European cities now, but there's almost nothing over the whole world. But this is what it looks like today. And I think there's a very strong case to be made that this is the most radical change that human beings have made to the environment. Um, you can see immediately why we talk about sustainability when we talk about night lighting, because it takes a huge amount of energy to make this light. And approximately, the estimate is 30% of it is complete waste light that shined up into the air, that never went to the ground, wasn't used to light anything, didn't help anyone. So this is an area that we can very easily uh, make improvements on greenhouse gases, for example. But we haven't just made this nice picture, what we've also done is really radically changed the way the night is. And so I like to say that red is the new black. If you look at a picture from a natural area on Earth of what used to happen, clouds made the sky darker. So you had a bright star-filled sky, and when you had clouds, it got darker. But now in Berlin, first off, a clear night is 10 times brighter than a clear night in a natural area. But if we have clouds, it's 11 times brighter still. So that's 110 times brighter than a natural clear night. But of course, on a cloudy night in nature, it was even darker. So in urban areas, we're talking about a sky that's hundreds to thousands of times brighter than is natural. And uh, we'll get to why that's important in a moment. I just want to show something that we did, which is look at, uh, this is the other reason I say red is the new black. When you look at what light is uh, being reflected back, the red light that our cities make actually gets reflected back more from the clouds. And studying this is important for our quantification and simulation efforts of light pollution. 
and also because a uh, different spectrum affects different animals differently. So I know you're all waiting to hear about the hamsters, but uh, I want to just tell you a couple other things we did at the ECMO first. Um, one is to look at uh, what's called the celestial compass. And this is something that human beings can't see unless you wear polarized sunglasses. So next time you're at the beach in the summer with polarized sunglasses, try this. Look out at the water and you won't see the reflection. That's the point of polarized sunglasses. But then turn your head sideways and you'll be able to see it all. And then look up in the sky at 90 degrees from the sun and start doing this. <laughs> and everybody on the beach is going to think you're a total idiot. <laughs> You'll be able to see uh, this celestial compass. And the reason we call it that is because the animals that can see it, they don't just see a changing in the brightness of the sky. They can actually perceive the direction somehow. And so I imagine that this looks to them something like a rainbow. Um, and it stretches sort of from south to north. And you can imagine if you could go outside, and instead of just having a blue sky, you had this rainbow all the time, it would be really difficult to lose your way. So it's a great thing to use. And lots and lots of animals at daytime use it. At nighttime, we've now discovered 10 years, not with the FU, but we, it was discovered 10 years ago that there are nocturnal animals that make use of the moon signal. So we asked ourselves, well, what happens inside of the city when we make all this light that comes back down? It's unpolarized. And just like if you have a bird trying to sing inside of the city and it's too noisy, that, light, that extra light that we make ends up drowning out the celestial compass. And so that's bad for any animal that wants to use it. We also made a photograph of, photographs of Berlin at night from airplanes, and from our airplane. And uh, I would really love to tell you more about this, but because of the time, I don't have a chance. So uh, all of our papers that we've published are either in open source journals or I have an author copy on our website. So if you want to read about it, I really encourage you to do it. I think this is one of the easier areas of science for everybody to understand. So I think that you should be able to understand uh, our papers if you want to. So finally, let's come to the hamsters. Now, it's really the European social bull, the hamster is fascinating to say. So uh, in Israel, they had a problem with these hamsters. They were eating the alfalfa crops. And they wanted to do something about it in a, in a less damaging way than dumping poison on the crops. So uh, they thought, well, these hamsters, they have their babies in the winter, in the fall. So why don't we try tricking them into thinking it's summer? We'll have two experimental sets. One of them, they go under the moonlight and the sunlight, the natural light. And the other one will shine a street light on during the nighttime and see what happens. So they did the experiment, and the ones under natural light, just like expected, had lots of babies. When they looked at the ones in the, underneath the street light, they were shocked because they were all dead. <laughs> so they thought, well, that's weird. Let's try that again. Um, this time, <laughs> we'll only shine the light for 15 minutes every four hours and see what happens. And it was the same thing. They all died. So they went to the lab to try and figure it out. And what it turned out was that the hamsters were really tricked into believing it was summer. They need to regulate their body temperature differently in winter from the summertime. And even though they can sense the temperature, just like you and I can, um, their whole body was working off of uh, the light signal and thought it was summer. They didn't uh, regulate their temperature properly and, they, properly, and they effectively died of hypothermia. Even though with the exact same temperature, they could have had lots of babies. So it shows what extreme effects light can have. But of course, that's just hamsters. It doesn't matter for humans, right? Uh, unfortunately, it turns out that light affects us too. Um, you know when you travel with jet lag, that when the, uh, when the light is different from what your body expects, it's a huge stressor. And what we're doing when we light our houses at home is effectively giving ourselves permanent jet lag. And you can imagine that not getting enough sleep is connected to lots of different diseases. And through uh, the hormone melatonin, we believe that, uh, or there's, there's fairly good reason to think that a lot of diseases like premature aging, cancer, and possibly even obesity are connected to the light we have at night. So what should a city do if they want to do something about this? Well, the first off, put light where it's needed, on the street. Don't shine it up into the uh, sky, and don't shine it directly into people's faces, which makes them less able to actually see what's going on. So you can see an example of one city here where they switched all of the lights to be pointing just at the street. And you look at these trees, and now all the birds that live there aren't getting light shot on them anymore. So that's great. It costs less money, it's sustainable. And what can you do personally? Well, first, you can join the International Dark Sky Association, which is an environmental organization for the night. Uh, talk to your political representatives in Leipzig and tell them what kind of lighting you want, that you don't want it in people's bedroom windows, you don't want it shining way down the street where it just causes glare. You want the light to go where it's needed. 
Take a trip to a local dark sky park. Hopefully, Natural Park Best Halfland will soon become a dark sky park where you can see the Milky Way very wonderfully. And think about your circadian hygiene, which I think people will talk a lot more about in the next 10, 15 years, which is that in the evening, maybe in your bathroom, instead of having really blindingly bright lights, try and use a dim light when you brush your teeth and not have a huge dose of light right before you go to bed. It will probably help you sleep better, and uh, it can possibly help against a lot of things like breast cancer and prostate cancer. So, thank you to everybody who made images, especially my sister-in-law Nadine, who do the hamsters, and uh, Dr. Uh, <laughs> Max and Pace.